my friend Mark Hendrickson in Kansas City at his house, actually, in the backyard, enjoying a cup of coffee with our cups here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> in the hat. <laughs> Just uh, completed a, a three-day conference of Ascended Life Community. We'll talk about it in a minute, but I always like to start off with just uh, our, our, our guests sharing a little bit about their, their journey with Jesus. So Mark, tell us a little bit about um, you and who you are and what you do. Mike, it's a ton of fun to be your friend and a uh, friend of Permission Ministries. And, uh, so yeah, gra- good to have you here. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, so I grew up, <coughs> was born and grew up in a pastor's home. Makes me a PK, preacher's kid. Yep. And uh, got saved about uh, 14, filled with the Spirit about 15, and didn't really ever have any uh, sow your wild oats years, you know. Just seemed like kind of pretty much steady journey. Uh, And as good as my father was, which he was an amazing man of God and a great uh, uh, leader, pastor. But uh, as good as he was, I'm pretty sure I didn't want to be a minister. (laughs) And why was that? Uh, well, uh, it was hard. There were difficulties, you know, when you're out in rural communities mm-hmm. and people don't want to change too much, you right, know? Right. And so that and the fact that uh, we were pretty poor, quite poor. And uh, now that didn't leave any scarring and I have no offenses about my childhood. Right. I don't hold any grudges to anybody. My parents are great parents. But... Uh, I was pretty sure I didn't want to be a minister. But I just kept doing things like leading worship, and pretty soon I'm leading house churches. Doing things you enjoyed doing? Yeah, I liked yeah. doing it, while at the same time I had a job. and So about 30 years old, I turned around and said, oops, I think I became a minister. <laughs> well, what were you thinking you were going to do, though? I'm just curious. As, you, know, you weren't going to do ministry, but what was in your heart to... I, I, mean, I, I know you were, you were a builder, contractor, you did that stuff, so was that's that right. kind of where you were heading? That was the most... Fun thing I could think of. I definitely didn't want to be on an assembly line. Type right, thing. right. You know, right. I, I had to have things new and fresh. And you know, when you put two boards together, you got something. Right, you can right. Look at them, and it's like, whoa, I did this. You're you know? building the house. Yeah, that's pretty. That's important. right. Yeah. So that was the best thing I could think of at the right. time, but I was still uh, involved with uh, spiritual things, as I said, leading of worship and uh, house churches mm-hmm. that type. Somewhere along the line, somebody said, could you be an associate pastor? And that's where I kind of took note of, oops, I think I became one, you know. <laughs> so the Lord... Got the, drafted. The moral of that story is, the Lord will get you to where he wants you to be, <laughs> maybe even if you don't want to. You know, there's two things about your, your story, Mark, I've always been uh, blessed by and attracted by, is uh, your understanding, and maybe this is part of your growing up, you had to kind of work through those issues of, you know, the hard knock life of, of uh, you know, our family went through it. You know, when you're serving, sometimes there's not a lot of funds to go around, and but you're serving the Lord, and sometimes it can taint the kids a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we look back at it now, and we're pretty grateful, actually, because yeah. we've seen some families where kids get a lot, and sometimes don't work out too well. Yeah. But still, you got to process through maybe some of the poverty mentality. Uh-huh. So you wrote a great book called Supernatural Provision uh-huh. that uh, I think is one of the best personally one of the best financial books around as far as how to set your heart right with God and how to be a, a giver, a receiver from Him. So yeah. maybe just touch on that for a second. I think it's a it's a important lesson for many Christians, especially those in the ministry. Yeah. I've tried to analyze uh, why me and my sister, there's only two of us, two siblings in our family, why we didn't come up with scarring and that type of thing. Mm. And I'm pretty sure, this may not be 100% the case, but I'm pretty sure that it's because my parents weren't just religious people. Mm -hmm. They didn't just preach a religion. They didn't even just practice a religion. There were real live God stuff, Mm -hmm. God things, Mm -hmm. miracles, provision that was of the God kind that couldn't have been done by any other way. So I knew even though we didn't <coughs> have more than in, more than enough, we always had enough. I, mm-hmm. I don't think my dad was ever in debt. Never missed a deal, meal. Never missed. No, nope. yep. never missed a meal. Even if we didn't know where it was going to come from, and somebody had put a 
bag of groceries at our door. I remember some of those stories you had. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I think the thing, the reason I wasn't scarred, and my sister wasn't scarred either, is because my mom and dad really incorporated God into it, and we uh, celebrated the miracles. Mm. And so we knew it wasn't, uh, you know, just scratching gravel and trying to make something happen. There was a God who was really involved. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, gave us a leg up into what helped me write that book. And that book is really comes out of uh, the way we live, Experience, even yes. currently. Yep. Yeah. You know, there, I just a lot of, I run into a lot of PKs, I'm sure you do too, that mm -hmm. really had struggles because of maybe some of those issues. Mm -hmm. I think you hit on an important topic that your parents <coughs> were, were authentic. Yeah, very and much. Um, um, sometimes in church we can get caught up in the religious side or, you know, parents can be authentic and sometimes uh, go through hard times and people turn on you in church yeah. and people take wounds and take offense. Yeah. Let me talk about that for a second because I, I find if you don't get over those offenses, mm -hmm. you get stuck. And a lot of people get stuck in their walk with God, even though they had a Christian background. It's true. Um, we're old enough at this point that we've seen uh, quite a few cycles or moves of God mm -hmm. that have come through our lives and into the larger church world. Uh, sadly, um, well, human beings in general are not real prone to change unless it's us doing the initiation of it. Mm. And so when a new change comes, uh, God opens up a new emphasis or highlights a new rhema into the body of Christ. There are those who love to embrace that, and there are those who become the antagonist mm. or uh, against whatever that is. And then when we make outward uh, mm, vocalizing of resistance or disparaging remarks about that, it is, it is, I think, just as you said, we get stuck. Not just from our own mentality, but we've set something in motion in the spirit realm. Mm. Mm. We put up a roadblock that whatever God wanted to bring through that new emphasis is now going to be held somewhat at bay or somewhat at a distance from you until or unless we go back to that place in our hearts, in our, mm -hmm. you know, being, and we repent of it and say, God, whatever the, mm -hmm. the bona fide God thing was that you wanted to bring through that emphasis, whatever that is, I repent for resisting it, just saying crazy offhand remarks, right. you know, and God, I want to embrace whatever it is. I think then we can begin the growth process. Mm. And sometimes, for instance, recently, um, a church who I was very intimately involved with uh, resisted the prophetic 32 years ago hmm. and just recently have now opened the doors. They've repented big time. He's prolific repentance <laughs> to people that he's... Uh, Remember this story, yes. Yeah. yeah. And God is beginning to restore them, but <laughs> they've got a little time to make up, you know, a lot of miles to yeah. recuperate. Yep. Yeah. We've walked through several of those moves. You know, uh, for me, Calvary Chapel, where I met the Lord, yes. had great memories there. Went to the vineyard. That was a fresh move. You know, we both walked into the Toronto yes. experience. And we're going to talk a little bit about another another move that God seems yeah. to be upon. Yeah. So I, I think that's one of the keys to staying fresh with God is not getting stuck. And you mentioned, you know, um, asking for forgiveness, but also forgiving others. Yeah. maybe authorities in our life, pastors, mm -hmm. maybe even our parents in some cases, that we've got it, I call it keep it clean. Yeah. Keep it clean. Don't don't let those things bog you down. It it it, it taints your perspective on life with others yeah. and we need to keep things fresh. Uh, in this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Right. Trials and tribulation. Uh, through many trials and tribulation, we entered the kingdom of heaven. There ain't no smooth road. Right. in this world and uh, anywhere there are humans including you and me there's going to be problems right. <laughs> if we want to go to the place where it's perfect and then we get there yeah. it ain't going to be perfect yeah. anymore it's not greener No, <laughs> that grass ain't greener and so uh, it is true that uh, uh, if we get offended at God and or at people hmm. uh, somewhere along the line we will have to go back before we can keep moving ahead in a mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, healthy uh, growth. Yep. Um, Mark, you were very, uh, you and your family were at the beginning stages of IHOP, House of Prayer, that I think it's gone on 20 years? 23. Just finished 23 years, International House of Prayer um, in Kansas City, launched, uh, and it's been continuous for, like I said, 23 years. Yeah. What, what's your memory of that? Where, we, where what's, what, what place did you play with that in your family? Remember I said, uh, or, or just for the sake of the record, uh, Bob Jones prophesied in 1983 that there would be a 24-hour house of prayer and worship in South Kansas City, mm -hmm. and then he pointed a number of us and said, you and you and you will be a part of that. Well, in 1999, through a series of God things, prophetic words from somebody over here and over here, and they compared notes, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is that which was spoken of. Right. And it's time to kick it into gear. That was May of uh, 1999. And uh, so Mike and another guy named Noel Alexander began the House of Prayer, and uh, within just a few months we traveled from uh, Wisconsin, which is where we lived at the time, and we came to help support it. Right. And within just a few visits we knew that we had to come right. be a part of it. So our whole family moved. At this point we had uh, four children, and they were all musicians, as was as in, uh, Debbie and I. Uh, and uh, so we had six of us that were musicians and, and very familiar with leading worship. And the thing that's primary or paramount in House of Prayer is spontaneous singing. Mm -hmm. Not just singing corporate songs, but singing spontaneously. and Catching and what the Spirit's doing. That's right. Yeah. And then making up the song in the moment, which is biblical. Four times scripture says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. song. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, by August that year, we moved here. And uh, I'm sorry, it was the next year we moved here, and but had continued making trips during that time. And there were 30 people who were going uh, 13 hours a day for the first five months. So from May to September, 30 people went 13 hours. By September, there were enough people moving here from all over the world even. Yeah. So we want to be a part of this, Mike's like, be a part of what? I mean, he always called us little, rough, and ugly. <laughs> little, rough, and ugly. He said, we don't even know what we're doing. He also characterized it like this. We're building a ship out at sea. If we can keep more water out than's coming in, then we're still afloat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pioneer to me. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. And boy, I mean, things changed every few weeks to a few months. You know, people change schedules to accommodate a new dynamic yeah. that we wanted to implement. It's fun, ain't it? And then, yes. let's try it all this way. And it was like, Okay, you know, just <laughs> hang on for dear life. But uh, anyway, it was a, a ton of fun because if you're a pioneer, mm -hmm. you love starting something brand new. Yeah, yeah, really good stuff. So yeah, we 24-7, uh, uh, people came from all over the world and, and uh, holidays, people would leave to go back to their families, right? Well, since we lived only a mile away, uh, they'd call up the Hendricks. Hendrickson's, can you fill in for us? Or if there was a snowstorm, uh, we can't get there. Can you get there? You know? So uh, one call gets them all. So was, was this one was just down the street from you still, or was it a different place at the time? Uh, they've been two locations, but they're all within a mile and a half. So you were the easy go-to. Exactly. You could put your <laughs> sn snowshoes on and get down there if you need exactly. to. Exactly. <laughs> and if the power goes out, well, you just have an acoustic set. There you know? Keep the prayer going. Yep. May the fire on the altar never, never go, go out. out. <laughs>